What is shaking, everybody? Welcome to the Wind Up Podcast. I am your host, Mike of MTGA Wines, and today we're getting into wine phenolics, wine tannin and structure. Uh, it has been a long time coming since we dove back into actual winemaking, how we achieve certain things stylistically, and what we as winemakers can do to manipulate some of these things, not just out in the vineyard, but also in the cellar. So we're going to dive into that. Uh, for a very good reason, we've been focused a lot on the wine business side of things, trends, finances, all the stuff that a lot of people really don't talk about. And that has been a lot of fun over the last few months. But as we get closer to harvest, we're just a couple of short months away before grapes start hitting the deck and we start making wine again. I want to give a couple of episodes uh, some attention in terms of the you know winemaking aspect of things, how we achieve certain things. Uh, this is also coming hot off the heels of a great uh, seminar through ETS Laboratories. We'll get into who they are here in a minute uh, with the Napa Valley Vintners over the last couple of weeks uh, and kind of diving into a little bit more detail in this topic in particular. Uh, it also made me realize that this is stuff that's worth sharing with you all because this is the kind of stuff that we within our inner circles talk about in terms of our wine styles, how we achieve certain things, and what we look for in the wines that we're trying to create. And I think it'll give you all a lot of great perspective in kind of how our thought processes kind of work and what we're trying, how we're trying to achieve certain styles. I think that made sense. Maybe that didn't. In essence, we're going to talk about how we achieve certain wine styles in terms of the overall structure, specifically when it pertains to the tannin structure. Uh, before we get into all that lovely nerdiness, a couple of quick announcements as usual. Be sure to follow us on all of our social networks at MTGA Wines. Uh, the Instagram and the YouTube are the two where we are the most active. Uh, you can also follow us on the Book of Face and the social network formerly known as Twitter at MTGA Wines will be the handle on all of those. Uh, thank you all for the, those that have continued to uh, download, rate, review and are subscribing to the show uh, please continue sharing it with your friends who are into wine food hospitality travel all of the things uh, we're going to continue to try and open as many doors for you all to walk through to know to get to know this industry uh, a little bit better as the episodes go on uh, last but certainly not least uh, for those that are a little bit more interested in our wines what we do uh, my uh, better half, Brittany, and I, uh, you can head to mtgawines.com. You can sign up for our newsletter there. You can check out some of the wines that we have available, some of the different things that we do, uh, and that'll kind of fill you in on some of the gaps that maybe we don't cover necessarily in the show, although I use a lot of our own kind of personal you know, winemaking uh, endeavors as kind of benchmarks for what we talk about. So without further ado, wine tannin, wine phenolics. Now, there's a common misconception about tannins and that when you say a wine is dry it means you're talking about these tannins right and it's if you've ever had a sip of red wine or maybe if you haven't really paid attention to it before the next time you have a glass of red wine give it make it like a little bit of mouthwash like swirl it around your mouth kind of as if you're using mouthwash i should say and once you get done with that you'll kind of feel it like tighten up a little bit on your gums on your cheeks those are the tannins work there are tannins in all kinds of things, not just grapes, as it turns out. Uh, there's tannins in some of the barrels that we use uh, that's extracted into the wine. There's tannins in the skins of certain fruits and vegetables. Uh, tannins are very prevalent pretty much everywhere. And there is this common misconception uh, when it comes to talking about wine that when you say something is really dry, you're talking about the tannin. Sorry. That's incorrect. That's not the nomenclature that we use when it comes to talking about tannin. Dryness, when it comes to the wine industry, is what we use to describe sugar content and how sweet a wine is or isn't. When you say a wine is dry, that means that there is little to no sugar. There's kind of a variable. There's not like an actual like number. Uh, that is official or from like a regulatory standpoint, but typically if you're looking at, you know, less than two grams of sugar per bottle, that wine is technically dry, even though some of us would argue that point, uh, you know, 
for wines that we make, we have, I mean, less than half a gram of sugar, uh, even less than a third of a gram of sugar per bottle. So really, really low, uh, if any at all, remaining in our wine. So there is a bit of a range there to be had. But when we're talking about dryness, sugar is what we're talking about. We're not talking about tannin. Tannin is something completely different. Um, although it can make the wine feel dry because of, you know, when you swish it up on your cheeks or you're kind of taking a sip, you feel it tighten up. And it almost kind of feels like you had a couple of saltine crackers. The moisture kind of like wicks away almost. But the beautiful thing about these tannins is that they do dissipate, one, over time. They soften up. Uh, but two, it's why, you know, wine pairs so well with food, whether it's white wine or red wine, although white wines typically have far less tannin, if uh, hardly any at all tannin at all, uh, just because of how they're made. Red wines definitely carry the heavy load of tannin when it comes to winemaking. We'll get into why here in a second. Uh, but it's why it pairs so well with food, because if you have something that's a little fatty, some cheese, some meat, something along those lines, uh, the proteins in those delightful dishes actually bind with those tannins and smooths it out, basically. Uh, so it makes the wine feel and seem a lot smoother than maybe it is on its own. It's why tasting a wine on its own, it might be like, ooh, that's a little edgy, that's a little intense. And then you have it with a bite to eat, you're like, oh, this is actually really sexy and delicious. This is kind of crazy how much it changes. And tannins do a great job of making a wine versatile in, in that sense. But there are a couple different types of tannin that we're going to be talking about. And there are going to be different styles that folks are trying to achieve with these different types of tannin. Uh, we are going to get a little geeky in this episode, uh, so I'll try not to work my way through it too fast. Uh, but let's just go ahead and dive right into the deep end. Now, for those that of you that are thinking that tannin is what makes you flush or gives you a wine headache, sorry, you're wrong. It's probably something else. Uh, tannin is not going to be the culprit, much like sulfites very much typically they're not the culprit of that either. Now, you have other things at play that are typically causing those issues. Tannin is simply a structural component. It is something that, of course, when it comes to red wines, you expect. The reason you expect it is because red wines are processed with their skins and their seeds, you know, mixed up amongst the juice in a substance that we call the must, uh, where it is just this concoction of skins, seeds, and the juice freshly squeezed out from the grapes, all in just the big vat, the tank, the bin, whatever it's being fermented in. The skins contain a certain amount of tannin, as do the seeds. Um, you could even say if you're doing whole cluster fermentations that the stems would have a certain amount of tannin that you could extract from them as well. Now, all these tannins that from all these different sections or segments of the grapes are not created equally. Uh, very typically, uh, your skin tannins are going to be a lot softer. Uh, they're going to be a little sexier. And the best way I can describe it is that it almost feels like silkiness, uh, really smooth, really nice. The tannins that you're going to extract from the seeds, on the other hand, and maybe even the stems, which are typically are a little greener, even more so, right? are going to be more like velvet or even sandpapery. Like they get really rough really fast. Uh, they're just much more intense. So how do we measure those things? How do we, you know, figure out like how much of one or the other that we actually have in our wines? Is there a way to do that even? And when we're producing a wine, how do we make the decisions of like, okay, it has enough tannin or maybe not enough? And what can we do to help solve those issues? Well, as it turns out, uh, I did mention ETS Laboratories. Uh, they're a local laboratory here in St. Helena, uh, although they have labs all around the world uh, that can do some very specific testing for us. And we can actually measure how much tannin is in our wine. Uh, there's a pretty wide range of scale uh, depending on, you know, what variety you're working with and also kind of where just that wine falls and how you processed it. It's a pretty big range. Uh, during this seminar that we're at, we actually tasted six wines, and this might not mean uh, a lot, but in the range of tannin, we tasted wines that basically... Uh, I almost imagine like it's a scale of like one to a thousand. That's not like the actual scale they use, but at least it will give you like perspective. 
and you figure like okay you know the higher that level the higher the tannin and the rougher the wine is the lower the level the lower the wine is it's basically just a sliding scale like that and there were certain wines that we tasted uh, during this seminar that were relatively close you know you would say like oh these have in essence within a margin of error the same amount of tannin in them there are wines that had far more there are wines that had far less and we got to sit down and compare and contrast these six wines and talk about the tannins that come from the skins and also the tannins that come from the seeds and how that impacts the overall wine it was a very interesting very nerdy wine tasting for us now before you know we even get to taste some of these wines there's a lot that comes into play in terms of you know how prevalent these tannins are going to even be in these wines and it really comes down to a couple of things one is going to be you know what variety you're working with because i can tell you right now that something like pinot noir doesn't have a lot of tannin in the skin but it has a whole bunch in the seeds right then you have something more like Syrah or Cabernet where there's a lot more tannin in the skins and there's also still a bunch of tannin in the seeds Which is why things like maybe a Syrah or a Cabernet tend to be a little rougher a little bit more intense than say something like a Pinot Noir Right makes sense as you might expect But here's kind of the kicker is that when we talk about kind of like these lab tests and these tannins being extracted from either the skins or the seeds is that it is actually fairly tough to identify what tannins are coming from where because it's the same molecular compound so there's a secondary kind of proxy measurement that we use to kind of ballpark how much seed tannin we actually have which is kind of nice because that is the rougher of the two it's the most intense of the two it can also be the most austere and bitter of the two so if that's getting really really high you might want to know that potentially uh, and that way you can say oh this wine is getting really rough around the edges let's go ahead and stop get this you know juice off of the skins away from the seeds and let's not increase the amount of tannin that we have past a certain point right so you can run these analytics like as you're going and during the fermentation process that can be a huge gift to a winemaker who's trying to hit a specific number it's definitely kind of the science of winemaking that kicks into gear with some of these measurements on the other hand and this would be my opinion is that more often than not it is used as a crutch because you can have tannin levels that are deceiving and this is probably the this is something that I actually didn't know. I always kind of assumed. I'm not really sure why I assumed this. But I assumed it was going to be a lot easier to distinguish, say, seed tannin from skin tannin. Knowing that they feel very, very different, that there must be different ways to measure them. But there isn't necessarily, which is why we have to use this little proxy called catechin to measure the seed tannin. And Basically, the higher that is, the more seed tannin you've extracted and probably the rougher the wine is. Uh, and then the kind of main tannin number that we look at uh, includes that, but also the skin tannin on top of it. So, you know, it's really just to give you a ballpark idea of like, hey, you've extracted probably a lot of skin tannin or, or sorry, seed tannin and your wine's gonna be a little rougher around the edges. And if that number's lower, then you're probably gonna make a little silkier, a little sexier wine rather than something that's, you know, that intense kind of chewy style of wine. So it's not a perfect measurement, uh, which is always fascinating to, you know, be talking to doctors and scientists in, in our field and to still have, you know, not total like 100% solid answers. There's still a lot of research, a lot of work, a lot of things being done to kind of perfect some of these tests and give us winemakers better tools when it comes to these lab reports that some of us rely on. Now, stylistic considerations, right? I think it, this might go without saying, but we'll dive into it anyway, that if you're trying to you know, make a really sexy, really smooth, very approachable style of red wine, you probably want more skin tanning because that's a little sexier, a little smoother. If you're looking for that go big, go home, intense, 
chewy style of Napa Cabernet, you probably want a little bit of seed tannin in there as well to give it a little extra oomph, you know? So depending on your winemaking style and kind of where you want to hang your hat as a wine producer, you will focus on one of those two things. And maybe, and realistically, honestly, it's going to be some combination of both, but there are certain things you can do in the winemaking process and during fermentation or post-fermentation that will allow you to have a little bit more of a focus on the skin tannin versus seed tannin. Mike, what are those things? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here are some tricks of the trade that us winemakers use. Number one, and just in case you're not familiar with the fermentation process, what typically happens with our red wines out here is that we will de-stem the grapes, we'll pop them off the stems, we'll discard the stems because those are gonna be far too edgy. Some folks will do some whole cluster fermentations, but it's typically sparingly and used as a blending component. Some folks will bottle it up on its own as well. There's always exceptions, of course, but more often than not, the stems are removed. After which point, uh, the grapes are crushed so that the juice can fro flow freely out of them and they're placed into some sort of vessel, whether that's an oak barrel, a stainless steel tank, a bin of some sort, a bucket of some sort, whatever, wherever that fermentation is gonna take place, that's where that must ends up. That's that combination of skins, seeds, and grape juice, right? Now, what's interesting is that unless you've crushed up a bunch of the seeds, you're really not gonna be extracting a lot of seed tannin at this point because it's not readily available. The skins, however, you have crushed. You've popped those grapes, the skins are broken, and tannins are starting to kind of leach out into it. But it's gonna be at a pretty slow rate, right? And the way that we get more tannin extraction, both from the skins and from the seeds, is through a couple of things. One is going to be the alcohol that's created during this fermentation. Alcohol will leach tannin out of the skins and the seeds and get it into the juice, right? The second thing is heat. And naturally, fermentations tend to run pretty warm. A lot of our fermentations actually run kind of in the 80 to 85 degree range. And that helps with that tannin extraction as well. So naturally, going through this fermentation process, you're creating alcohol and there's heat being created. So it creates an environment where it's pretty easy to extract tannin. And as a winemaker, you gotta figure out, okay, at what point do I want to stop extracting tannin? And keep in mind, this is like stopping a giant freight train. You can't just stop it and say, okay, no more tannins coming. It's not a hard stop. You're gonna have to call it a little bit short because you know you're gonna be extracting more, more tannin as time goes on, right? And even more so, if you're using a bunch of brand new oak barrels, you're gonna be extracting some tannin from those barrels as well. So those are some other things that you gotta kinda of keep in the periphery, be like, okay, we can't wait until we're past the point we wanna be. We probably wanna head this thing off at the pass to make sure we end up right where we wanna be. It's a little bit of a game of chicken, but that's kinda of what you have to do. Now, let's say you want to make that go big, go home Cabernet. You're like, all right, we're gonna make the biggest, baddest wine we can. What you're gonna do is do an extended maceration, typically. Uh, this means the fermentation process has wrapped up. Uh, there's no more sugar to be converted into alcohol. There's very little. That process has basically come to all but a halt. But you wanna keep that juice and this now freshly made wine in contact with the skins and the seeds because that alcohol that's now present is gonna continue leaching out tannin from those things to give you that extra intensity, that extra structure, that extra chewiness. And on the flip side, if you're trying to make something a little softer, something a little bit more approachable, you're probably gonna press that juice, up, juice out of those skins and off of those seeds sooner rather than later because you don't want to extract too much tannin necessarily. So stylistically, those are kind of the avenues that you can go down. And of course, there's a bunch of cross streets in between those where you can do a little bit of something here, a little bit of something there, maybe extend that maceration for just a few days or maybe a week. Uh, we were talking to somebody after the seminar that extends it up to 30 or 45 days past that fermentation process to get as much extraction as they possibly can. Then there are folks like us where we're like, you know, Basically, as the fermentation is wrapping up, it's not quite done yet. We press off early. We press off wet, we, which is what we call. We say, hey, there's still a fermentation happening, but we want this fermentation to finish 
in the barrels because I'm trying to avoid a certain amount of seed tannin in our wines. I don't want our wines to be too rough around the edges. I want them to be a little softer, a little sexier. And that's my trick of the trade. Now, it's really no secret, but that's how I do it. That's how many winemakers do it. So those are kind of the things that you can do to both extract more tannin and also mitigate how much tannin you actually have. Now, there are also some other tricks of the trade later on down the line. We've talked about this in some of our wine additive episodes. If you haven't checked those out, you can go back. Uh, we did one last year. We're going to do another one uh, coming up to dive into some more detail about wine additives again. But there are things like tannin powder uh, where you can add more tannin to your wine if it doesn't quite have enough to it. Uh, not that winemakers will ever label their wine as such, but that's the, one of the dirty little secrets where it's like, oh, it doesn't have enough structure. We'll just little you know salt bay into the into the wine we'll you know add that no problem no problem you can also remove tannin if your wine is a little too rough around the edges you can use things like egg whites or icing glass uh, both of which we talked about in those additive episodes uh, to help remove a little bit of tannin because the proteins in there actually bind with that tannin much like the food that you're eating when you're drinking that big cabernet and it pulls them out of solution and you can just filter them out easy peasy uh, lemon squeezy I guess. So even though, you know, there's this kind of natural process of tannin extraction or mitigating that tannin extraction, there are a lot of things that winemakers can do on the back end before bottling or at some point during the winemaking process to either increase the amount of tannin they have or even decrease it. There's plenty of ways to go about it. Now, what does this all mean for you, the consumer, in terms of, you know, enjoying a wine? Why does tannin matter to you? Well, a couple of reasons. One, it's definitely something that adds structure and intensity to your wines. So if you're into those big, bold reds, you're probably going to want something that has a good amount of tannin in there because that adds that extra oomph and that structure to it. It also is something that if you're into aging wines, that acts as a great backbone to the wine. I think it's secondary to the acidity, personally. Uh, tannin is something that because it's, and acidity for that matter, can also be pretty easily manipulated. Uh, but for me, acidity is always kind of the A number one thing that I pay attention to when it comes to a wine's structure. Tannin is number two though, because I still want the wines, even though our wines can be very soft and very approachable, I still want them to have some grip. I still want them to have this little bit of X factor of structure that way they don't feel flabby, right? I don't want them to taste like red grape drink. I just want them to taste, I want them to have some structure and a little bit of bite to them. So even though we might press off a little early and might not extract as much tannin as other producers, we still want some in there to give these wines a little bit of umph, just a little something. And that also, and realistically, it helps increase the longevity of some of these wines, where if you like wines, like I'm that wine nerd that loves wine when it's, 10, 12, 15 years old, it needs some tannin in there. It needs some structure to help carry it along through those years to make sure that it stays solid and is enjoyable down that line. If there's not a lot of tannin in there, and if it's a, even more so it has low acidity and not a lot of structure to it, period, that's probably going to be the wine you want to crush by the pool tomorrow. You don't want to wait two years to enjoy it. You know what I mean? So when it comes to these tannin levels, you're going to take that into consideration as well. It's like, when is this wine going to be consumed? Is it going to be something that's meant to be a little sexier and more approachable and consumed today? Or is this something that we want to last for 20, 30 years and be enjoyable further on down the line? Those are also some of these stylistic considerations that we are making. And as a result, for those of you that like older wines, and don't mind buying young wine and waiting for it to age, you probably want to buy something that is maybe a little more tannic than you enjoy right now. You want it to be a little edgy because you know as those years go on, it's going to get softer. It's going to get more approachable, but it's, it can't get there if there's not enough tannin and structure there in the first place, right? Now, if you're someone that enjoys wines today, you know, if it lasts six months in your home or less, then that's a long time, then maybe you want wines that are a little bit more approachable. And believe me, there are plenty of us out there. I'm one of these people that sometimes I just want the biggest, baddest wine I can find. Give me something that's going to, you know, slap me upside the taste buds, right? 
So I'm going to go for that big, really intense, you know, wine that's got that extra tannin structure, that extra intensity to it, right? So there's a little something for everybody. But this can also help you when you're out shopping for a wine, whether it's in a restaurant, whether it's in a wine shop, you go to whoever's working the aisles in the shop, or you talk to the sommelier at the at the restaurant, you say, hey, you know, I'm in the mood for something, you know, I typically like kind of bigger, bolder wines, you know, good tannin structure, a little rougher around the edges. Uh, but tonight I'm kind of feeling something a little softer. I want something that's going to be a little bit more approachable, you know, something that's going to just be a line it up to knock it down style of wine. It can be a great benchmark kind of descriptor when you're shopping for wine. And even if you're, you know, going to a wine tasting or planning, a, you know, a trip out here to Napa and you're trying to hunt down certain producers, you can talk to them and say, hey, like what style, like what kind of style of wines do you make? Are they these really go big, big extraction, big tannin structure kind of wines? Or are they a little softer? Are they a little sexier? Like what kind of where do you fit? And it'll help you kind of narrow down places to go and wines to buy as a result. And although I always preface that with, you know, you never know when you're going to be surprised by something. Because uh, there are certain winemakers even that are known for these big kind of intense styles. And every once in a while you find that one that's like, oh, like it is big and intense, but it's really well integrated. It's very balanced in the same sense. So even though it's this massive wine, it's just yummy, which is kind of this weird vibe. It's a great vibe, but it can be a weird one because it kind of, you know, it's a bait and switch a little bit in terms of what your experience of that wine is going to be. So, you know, it's something that this is something that, you know, was tannins kind of get, you know, they don't get a lot of love. We don't talk about them too much. They're typically misconstrued as something else when we were talking about like that dryness kind of characteristic. Uh, but they are immensely important. Now, what was interesting, and this is going to be the part of the show where I get up on my little soapbox here about winemaking in general and kind of trends in and around Napa, uh, because that's what we've been talking about all year. You know, we've talked about the structure of the, these wines, you know, how tannins integrate into certain styles. But what, what does that mean for like the industry as a whole? And I think what was really interesting, and, and this is this might be fascinating to some of you um, who are, you know, wine geeks like out there like me, is we, I, you know, we're sitting there, you know, after the seminar, we're sitting around chatting, carrying on. And. I was asked probably three or four times by different folks, you know, so what, what tannin level do you shoot for? Like, what are you normally looking for in your wines? And I hadn't really thought about this beforehand, but I've never, not once, not once in 15 years of winemaking, not once have I ever run a lab test to see how much tannin is actually in our wines. And the reason why I haven't is not because of neglect or I don't care or uh, I think it's irrelevant, but when I'm making a wine, I'm tasting that wine twice a day, multiple times a day. I mean, it, it's I'm constantly in the weeds trying these wines and seeing exactly where they're at. When we're pressing our wines, and this is something that I uh, forgot to mention, that even as you're pressing a wine, you know, initially when you squeeze those grapes after a fermentation, you're getting all that nice, like sexy, the, some of the best wine that you're making from that year is going to come from the early part of that pressing cycle. As you get towards the end, you're squeezing those skins and those seeds harder and harder and harder. They're breaking down, they're cracking and opening up, and you're extracting more and more tannin and structure and bitterness out of them. So there are certain pressing cuts that you have to make as a winemaker to say like, oh, at this point in the pressing cycle, like we're setting that aside because it's going to be way too edgy to put with the rest of this right now. We're going to, that, that little guy, we're not going to worry about that little guy. We got to set that aside and kind of figure out what we're going to do with those pressed lots, right? But it was an, it was an interesting conversation to have with people. And, and there was like, no, there's no judgment. This is kind of the great thing about the wine industry that I try to you know, convey on this show is that there's no wrong way to go about doing this. But it was truly fascinating to be one of the people in the room that doesn't run this lab test, that never has run this lab test, and frankly, has no plans to do so. Why? 
because I'm on top of my fermentations and I'm just tasting as I go. And if it tastes great, I don't worry about it, right? If it's still a really soft, really sexy wine, it doesn't quite have that structure yet, we leave it on the skins and seeds a little longer. If it's getting a little rough around the edges, then I'm like, all right, let's go ahead and press this off and get it into barrel. And it sounds very simple, but that can be a tough judgment call for people to make. It certainly can be. And I think that's where something like these lab tests can be helpful, is that if you're not really sure what that point is, or if you're making a boatload of wine and it's going to be available in retail shops and restaurants around the country or around the world, you probably need to hit certain numbers. But at a certain point, and I am a firm believer in this, some of these lab tests, not just for tannin, but many other things, can become a crutch. And you're taking away a little bit of variability. You're taking away a little bit of X factor every time you try and dial in these numbers. And as a result, your wine is not what it could be. I'm a firm believer in that. That being said, there are plenty of folks who run these lab tests and make some of the best wines in the world. So, you know, who am I to judge? But... When you're painting the Mona Lisa by numbers, it's probably going to look similar, but it's not going to be the Mona Lisa, right? It's the, like I, I definitely employ, and many of us as small producers employ kind of the Bob Ross style of winemaking. That even that little mistake, there's a little more tannin in here than maybe we want, but guess what? That's a happy little tree now. We just touch it up a little bit. You know, we don't do any fining or filtering or anything like that. But throughout the aging process, you know, it's maybe why something's a little bit more tannic, a little bit more intense. I'm like, all right, let's not put that into a brand new barrel because that's just going to even, you know, one up it even more. Let's put that into a neutral barrel or a once used barrel, something that's going to be a little bit of a softer influence on the wine. There are these other judgment calls coming down the pipeline that I can utilize to amend things as we go rather than using fining, rather than using additives, or rather than using lab tests to tell me whether or not I'm doing the right thing. It was very, very fascinating. I was genuinely actually surprised by how many people use these lab tests. And you could hear this, the conversations around you saying, oh, we typically go for you know this level. Um, we noticed that the catechin was really high, so we got a little extra C10 in this one, but we'll do a little bit of fining to back that off a little bit. Actually, going back to that, like, catechin and total tannin level, it was super, super interesting. There were, I think, four of the wines, uh, basically in pairs, uh, that had, in essence, within that margin of error, the same tannin, total tannin level. So by the numbers, just looking at that, you're like, oh, well, these ought to be pretty similar structurally. What was interesting is that one out of each of those couples had a much higher catechin level. So the seed tannin was really, really high. And the skin tannin, as a result, was much lower. So comparatively, they were super rough, super green, super bitter, and just like really edgy compared to their counterpart, which was a little bit more lush, a little bit more approachable, a little sexier. And you're like, this is crazy because these tannin levels are very much within a margin of error. Realistically, not a big difference. But the wines are so different. They are so different. Which is why that tannin number can be deceiving if you're not measuring that catechin number as well. Um, so from, you know, from this seminar alone, I'm like, well, that's a great sales pitch for this lab. It's like, hey, by the way, if you're running this number, you probably need to run this one as well. Which I actually, I don't know how much that lab test costs off the top of my head. Um, but I know like anytime I run a, a lab test on a wine, if there's like five or six things that I'm looking at, it's probably going to cost me like 30, 40 bucks, 60 bucks per sample, give or take. So it can add up on you. It can certainly add up on you. Anyway, so it is interesting in that, you know, if you're measuring these things, you know, you have this idea of like, okay, well, we need an extra... X amount of tannin. And what was actually really interesting is that the winery that provided samples, uh, they didn't, they weren't able to say who it was. They kept it a secret, although all of us in the room were pretty sure we knew who it was. Uh, 
but there were certain wines of theirs that were like, hey, this is a sample from, in essence, our holy grail. Like this is the best of the best the vintage had to offer. And this one's the second best. And then everything else kind of falls into certain categories outside of that. It was super interesting. And the ones I didn't like were the ones that they loved. I'm like, oh boy, you and I have different styles of thinking on this, which is always fun because you get to talk a little bit of shop of like, I'm so impressed that this is something that you hang your hat on and that you get it to where you want to go because the way I'm tasting it just blindly, ooh, that one's gonna need some work. It's gonna need some work. It was very interesting. Uh, anyway, back to the conversations we were having. It was, it was just interesting hearing a lot of folks talk about the numbers. And it was folks that had been, you know, in places for maybe a year or two, maybe folks that were making wine here in the Valley for, you know, a decade or more like me. Um, there are a few interns that were there who are kind of new to the valley and, and gearing up to learn as much as they can, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed. And it was just it was a fascinating, I don't know, like case study into the, you know, opinions and thoughts of how great wine should be made in a place like Napa and kind of where these numbers should align if you're going to be making great wine here in a place like Napa. And as a dude in the room who was like, yeah, I've never run these numbers because I've never felt I've needed to because I'm, I don't want to sound super cocky. I'm not good at toot toot beep beeping my own horn. In fact, I hate doing it. But I do like to believe I'm pretty good at what I do and the wines speak for themselves. And the fact that I don't need a lab test to tell me that, it made me pretty happy. I felt pretty good after this seminar. I was like, man, this backs up a lot of the stuff that I already knew. I learned something and it confirmed my hypothesis on how great wine is made. And that is you can't do it by the numbers alone. As much as the laboratory scientists would tell you, hey, this is stuff you need to be paying attention to. Um, because if, you, if you're tasting those wines and you're looking at those numbers, and, and this is something that is equally true, because even amongst this set of wines, you saw wines that had that higher catechin level. There was gonna be more seed tannin. They were, in theory, were gonna be rougher around the edges and probably a little austere. And those were some of my favorite wines in the tasting because they had that there, there, they were intense, but they had that silkiness and that potential to get to where we wanna go. I should mention, we were tasting 2023 barrel samples. So we're talking about wines that are maybe nine months old, realistically. So they're babies. They've got at least another year, year and a half before they start getting bottled up, right? So these, these, are, these wines were rough, very much a stepping stone to where they're going to be. And that's where I was like, oh, some of these are actually like really great, like great potential in these wines. And others, I was like, whoo, those are a little rough. And then there were some that fell flat. They're like, oh, there's just not enough there, there, you know. But when you're tasting those wines and you don't know what the numbers are and something tastes and feels balanced, it has that great texture and it has the fruit characteristics, the alcohol, you know, everything else, the barrel characteristics are starting to show themselves. You're like, okay, this is like, you see the framework. The framing is up. Now all we gotta do is start building around it. There were some great moments of like, oh man, these wines are gonna be solid. And then you saw the numbers and you're like, oh, that doesn't make any sense at all because this wine should be, in theory, probably the edgier or some of the edgier wines, you know, in this lineup. It probably shouldn't be at this point based on what the numbers are telling us, but hey, they're pretty great. So it is something that kind of confirmed my own hypothesis on winemaking is that the numbers will only take you so far. And at a certain point, you need to be tasting your wine. You need to be feeling your wine. You need to feel that texture. You need to understand what is going on on your palate and be able to make the judgment calls necessary to make adjustments on the fly during harvest during fermentation when you're pressing how you're pressing what barrels you're going into and for how long and then of course when it comes to blending taking that spice rack of different lots you've created and creating something awesome out of it you know those are things that you need need to be able to do to be a great winemaker and i'm not saying i'm one of those yet i got a long way to go i got a long way to go but 
I think there is a little bit right now. Right now, I think we're, we're in a spot where there is a little bit of a plague of we need to hit certain numbers. There's a certain cachet to this thing that we're trying to achieve. And if we don't hit that number, we're not making the best wine we can, whether it's tannin or you know other phenolic markers or acidity or whatever. There are all kinds of things you can measure in these wines, tannin being one of them. And at a certain point, you just got to trust your taste buds. You really just got to trust your taste buds. All right, that has been the Wind Up Podcast. I hope you all enjoyed it. That 40 minutes flew by. Shoot. Who knew that talking about tannin and the structure of a wine and what it means could be so damn fun? Uh, Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, We will be back next week with another episode. Uh, Be sure, again, to follow us on all of our social networks at MTGA Wines. That is on YouTube, Instagram, the Book of Face, and the social network formerly known as Twitter. Uh, You can head to our website, mtgawines.com, and sign up for our newsletter. Check out some of the wines we're producing and all that good stuff. Please make sure that you're 21 years of age or older. Uh, Otherwise, we can't send you wine, obviously. That should go without saying. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Have an awesome rest of the week, weekend, and we will catch you next time. Cheers.